talk to him a little bit. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are and who you are in each of our lives. Father, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gift, the gift of eternal life. There's no greater gift we could have. And you know what, Lord? We can't do anything about getting it on our own. We cannot earn it. We don't deserve it. And we, we're not good enough to qualify for it. In fact, what we deserve is total opposite of what you gave us. And we're so thankful for your son, Jesus. And we're so thankful for your love for mankind, the, the human beings that you made, you created in your image. We're thankful that you cared enough for us that you sent your son, your only son, and he sacrificed to uh, his life for ours while we were still sinning and still doing bad things and we Lord we still do bad things but we know that Jesus is our Savior we know that he saved us and we know Father that we repent of each of those sins on a daily basis if we sin and we do help us to come to you right then and admit it and 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 repent of it and ask for forgiveness. What a gracious and merciful Lord you are. Thank you, Father, for this group here today. We pray, Father, that your hand will be on each family here and that your mercy and your grace will be with each one of us here. We thank you and we pray, Father, that you will address all the physical ailments that we have in your way. We pray that you'll address our spiritual ailments that we have with your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you again. We pray that you'd uh, just guide us now as we go into this time of study. Help us to realize just who we are in you and help us to walk in your will. Guide us by the Holy Spirit, and we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're looking at Noah. And in chapter 6, starting in verse 1, let's see, I lost it again. I put it in my pocket and I lost it. How about that? Uh, let me get it back. got a new phone <laughs> and it does good uh, come on come on all right here we are in verse one of chapter 6 of Genesis it says now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives from them for themselves of all whom they chose well that means that they took them one way or the other these are, these are these are the, the Nephilims that created the Nephilims from this. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive for, with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years, and, they were, and there were giants in the land those days, and also afterwards when the sons of God came to the daughters of men and bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of men of old and of men of renown. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Only evil continually. We're getting close to that right now. We're right back in the days of Noah. 
And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. He was sorry. Man, God was sorry he made us. I've wondered that quite a bit some from time to time. Was he not sorry that he made us? I, I can't help but believe he was. He made us in his image. He wanted us to be companions to him. He wanted us to be like him in many ways, but not him. And uh, he's, he gave us that capability of choosing yes or no, right or wrong, up or down. You know, we could choose. Animals choose to fight or flight. That's their choices. They don't, they don't really do much more than that. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, birds of the air, for I am sorry I have made them. How, how, how pressing that must be on God's heart to come to that decision that he's going to wipe us out. In verse 8 it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now why did Noah find grace when the others didn't? Noah was serving the Lord. He was a sinful man, just like everybody else, but he was serving the Lord in faith. He had faith in God. So, with that, Noah was set on a task. And I want you to think about Noah. He's told to build this, this thing called an ark. He'd never even seen an ark or a boat or a canoe or anything that floats on water. And he's going to build an ark? Well, God gave him instructions how to do it and what to do. And he went and started building this ark. And he built it for a few years, and his neighbors would come by and say, What you doing, Noah? I'm building an ark. God told me to build an ark, and I'm building an ark. What do you think the neighbors said? <laughs> You're doing what, Noah? What are you doing, Noah? And that's 10 years. How about when he got to be 70 years? He's now building art. They can see it's starting to look weird. It's getting sides. It's the biggest house they ever saw without a roof. And this, this, this is uh, something else. But what do you think those neighbors continue to say? They snuffled and sniffered and snickered and carried on and, and would not help him. I don't believe they helped him. Why would they help him do something that they couldn't? They wouldn't. They couldn't laugh at it if they were helping him. But anyway, Noah kept on. Him and his little family built this ark. Hundred and twenty years. Wow, that's older than me. That's older than Brad even. <laughs> so it's it's been a long time building. And what happens then? Lord sent Noah into the ark. Go into the ark. And the Lord closed up the door for ark for Noah was inside. And he allowed this ark to to float when the rains came. They didn't know what rain was. Can you imagine that? They did not know what rain was. But these people that laughed all found out what rain was. They found out what it was to go for a swim down at the lake. The lake was a big lake because it covered the world. And there was no place they could find a rest when they started swimming. So they all succumbed to the waters the animals and everything, except those on the ark. Well, we're going to look at this story on the ark and find out what my friend here has to say. My friend.
Lanier has to say about that as he goes into the story. So, It's one of the most fascinating and intriguing stories known to mankind. It can be found in virtually 200 accounts all around the world on almost every continent. However, many people today believe Noah's Ark and the Flood are just myths or some altered version of ancient beliefs. Of all the stories in the Bible, Noah's Ark and the Great Flood is one of the most controversial. Is it all true? Did it really happen? How did it happen? And if it is true, is there evidence for the flood found in geology and historical records around the world? In this video, we will be answering monumental questions such as, why do so many people dismiss the great flood and believe it's a myth? And why would God send such a catastrophic flood upon the earth? How big was the ark and how was it built? Where did the water come from to flood the whole earth? How long was there water on the whole earth? How did the climate change as a result of the flood? Where did all the water go after the flood? Is there evidence that can be seen today for Noah's ark and its location? And lastly, we'll end this video with some thoughts about what all this means for us today. So be sure to watch until the end. I believe you will be fascinated and touched by the amount of evidence that exists for the truthfulness of Noah's Ark and the Bible's account of all that took place surrounding this catastrophic event. So climb aboard and stay tuned as we take a journey through time and witness one of the greatest miracles that ever existed. historical evidence for the Great Flood. The Great Flood account is mentioned in writings or oral traditions found all around the world. In fact, as mentioned, it's referred to in around 200 accounts. These flood legends are common across a wide range of cultures, extending back to shortly after the flood accounts. These accounts depict a flood, sometimes global in scale, usually sent by a deity or deities to destroy civilization as an act of divine judgment. They are found on virtually every continent and share very similar themes. This is so because Noah's descendants stayed together until God confused their languages at the Tower of Babel, and they scattered as found in Genesis 11. As the various people groups spread around the globe, the story of the flood was so important and monumental that it was taken with them and shared. Over time, the Great Flood account became embedded in their respective histories and cultures. The oldest known written account of a global flood is the Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh from the 18th century BC. However, the most significant account of Noah and the Great Flood is found in the Bible in Genesis chapter 6 through 8. It's also mentioned 47 times throughout the Bible with references in nine different books such as Genesis, Chronicles, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Matthew, Luke, Hebrews, and 1st and 2nd Peter. This means Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jesus, the Apostle Peter, the writer of Hebrews, all attest to the truthfulness of this catastrophic event as being literal and real. 
What is very notable is the fact that Jesus referenced Noah and the flood five times in the gospel accounts. This is weighty evidence of the reality and truthfulness of Noah's ark and the great flood because Jesus referred to it as being a literal event, not some myth or fairy tale. Now there is no other historical figure who has influenced the world more than Jesus. No one comes even close to comparing with him. So if we don't believe Noah and the great flood were actually real events, we would be making Jesus out to be a liar or a lunatic. Now why do so many people dismiss the great flood and believe it's a myth? The creation of the universe, along with Noah and the great flood, are some of the most attacked writings by critics. Why is this so? I believe it's because creation deals with the fact that we have a divine creator to whom we must give an account. Sinful humanity desires to be the Lord of their lives and refuses to submit to their creator. In order to justify their sinful lifestyles, they attempt to eradicate their creator so they can do as they please. This is the root source of evolution. It denies the existence of God and tries to explain the existence of the universe by time and random chance. However, Everywhere we look, we see intelligent design, which attest to the existence of God. So just look around and notice everywhere you go and everything that you see, and you will see intelligent design everywhere. According to God, every person knows in the depths of their hearts that God exists. Therefore, there is really no such thing as an atheist. Romans 1, 18 through 21 addresses why there is really no such thing as an atheist. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now notice, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what is made, so that, listen carefully, they are without excuse. So according to God, there is no such thing as an atheist, because he has made himself known to them through his spirit, that he's given them a conscience, he has given them creation to see, so it says that there is no one that has an excuse. So, there is no such thing, according to God and his word, as an atheist. It continues, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings, and their senseless hearts were darkened. So it says that they did know God, and they turned away. That's why we have evolution. That's why we have people that don't believe the Bible, and they turn away to follow their own way because they don't want to submit to their Creator. Now, this same attitude of rejecting our Creator was prevalent in the days of Noah. This is the main reason God sent the flood. Today, many choose not to believe the creation and great flood accounts because they try to understand them using the natural laws of science. However, these events were supernatural and superseded natural laws. In fact, the whole Bible is full of supernatural events we call miracles because God is supernatural and is involved in his creation. Whenever God moves, it is supernatural. God also has created the laws of nature as well. So, whether something is supernatural or natural, everything that happens is due to God making it happen. In fact, nothing that happens does so without God working. When we understand and believe these truths, then the events of the creation and the great flood become very believable. Those who claim there is no evidence for the great flood do so by using their preconceived belief that there was no flood to begin with and then attempt to explain away the evidence using eons of time and random chance. 
Moreover, the creation of the universe was one of God's greatest miracles. It was completely supernatural, and when he was done, it was a mature, fully functioning system and had apparent age to it. Adam and Eve were created mature, along with the animals and some plants for food for them. This was also the case with the stars. They had apparent age, and as mentioned, God's creation was mature and fully functional. It did not evolve over time. Other than the creation of the universe by God Almighty and the works of Christ, there was no greater miracle recorded in the Bible than the Great Flood. It was a catastrophic event that altered the terrain, climate, and makeup of the earth. It lasted for around a year and wiped out everything that had the breath of life in its nostrils except Noah, his family, and the animals on the ark. Now why did God send such a catastrophic flood upon the earth? Genesis 6, 5 through 8 tells us why. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. So the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I have created from the face of the land, mankind and animals as well, and crawling things, and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God sent the flood because of the great wickedness of mankind upon the earth. The intent of their heart was only towards evil, except for Noah. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now did God give the wicked the opportunity to repent before the flood? In 2 Peter 2, 5, Noah is referred to as a preacher of righteousness. This means Noah was a preacher who preached to the people of his day to repent and turn from their wickedness to God. However, like most people today, the people of Noah's day were too busy enjoying the pleasures of life and did not believe Noah or care that judgment was coming upon them. We don't know how long Noah preached to the people of his day, but it could easily have been from around 50 to 100 years. And for those who didn't directly hear Noah's preaching, they had a conscience given to them by God, God's laws written in their hearts, and God's Spirit convicting them of their wickedness, as it says in Romans chapter 2. How big was the ark, and how was it built? In Genesis 6, 13, it says, Then God said to Noah, The end of humanity has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of people, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with compartments and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, or 515 feet, or 150 meters. Its width, 50 cubits, or 86 feet, or 26 meters. And its height, 30 cubits, or 62 feet, or 19 meters. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit, or 20.61 inches, or 52.35 centimeters from the top. And put the door of the ark on the side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Now the royal cubit was around 20.61 inches or 52.35 centimeters long. This was the standard measurement used around the known world at that time. It's like the metric system today. We see the royal cubit measurement used in the great pyramids of Egypt, gates at Tel Megiddo, the Temple Mount platform in Jerusalem, and other places. Now Moses wrote Genesis, so it stands to reason he would use this royal measurement as he was raised in Egypt, and it was universally used by all. The old cubit measurement seems to be referred to as well in Scripture. Second Chronicles 3, 3 says, 
Now these are the foundations which Solomon laid for the building of the house. The length of the cubits, according to the old standard, was 60 cubits, and the width, 20 cubits. The reference to the old cubit, or the old standard, seems to be speaking of the royal cubit. And it was used before the Israelites established a newer cubit that was a little shorter in length. Using the royal cubit, the ark would measure 515 feet, or 150 meters long, 86 feet, or 26.21 meters wide, and 52 feet or 15.70 meters high. Scripture also indicates the ark had three levels and many compartments for the animals. Now what did God destroy by the great flood? Genesis 6:17 says, Now behold, I myself am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is the breath of life from under heaven everything that is on the earth shall perish. This would eliminate all humans and animals as they lived by breathing oxygen. The sea and water creatures were not destroyed in the flood. Now what kind of animals did God save from the flood? There were two kinds or animal families God saved from the flood. The first type was regular animals. Genesis 6, 18 says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kind, and of the animals according to their kind, and of every crawling thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of every food that is edible and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and them. So Noah did these things according to everything that God had commanded him, so he did. A kind of animal is similar in meaning to a family of animals. A kind of animal or family of animals is very different than a species of animals. A species deals with all of the varieties within a kind or family of animals. So this doesn't mean God brought every species or variety of every animal, but two of every family of animals. This would reduce the number of animals that would have been on the ark considerably. For example, Today there are around three to four hundred different species of dogs. However, they all come from one kind of dog. So from one pair of dogs, all the different varieties are derived. The next kind of animal were the clean animals. And of the clean animals, God brought more of them upon the ark. It says in Genesis 7, 1 through 5, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven pairs of every clean animal. So of the clean there are seven pairs, a male and his female, and two of the animals that are not clean, a male and his female. So of the clean animals, seven pairs, of the regular animals, just two, a male and a female. Also, of the birds of the sky, seven pairs, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. So Noah acted in accordance with everything that the Lord had commanded him. So of the clean animals, there were seven pairs brought aboard the ark. This would allow for Noah and his sons to be able to offer some of them as sacrifices after the flood and not jeopardize their extinction. Both the regular and clean animals were most likely young and small, so they wouldn't take up a lot of space, wouldn't eat as much, and would have many years of reproductive life ahead of them after the flood to repopulate the earth again. 
This means that the dinosaurs brought aboard the ark were most likely young and small as well. Now, how did the animals come to the ark? It was God who supernaturally gathered the animals and brought them to Noah and the ark. Genesis 6:20 says, of the birds according to their kind and of the animals according to their kind, of every crawling thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every kind, it says, will come to you to keep them alive. So God brought the animals supernaturally to Noah so that they would be kept alive aboard the ark. Now who closed the door of the ark? Genesis 7:15 tells us, so they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life, those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him. And the Lord closed the door behind him. So it was God who supernaturally brought the animals to Noah. And then once they were all aboard, it was God who supernaturally closed the door of the ark. Now, when did the great flood begin? By the best records found in the Bible, the Great Flood took place around 2500 BC. Also, according to a literal interpretation of the Bible, God created the universe in about 4000 BC. This means the Great Flood took place about 1500 years after God created the universe. Now, where did the water come from to flood the whole earth? Genesis 7:11 says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. This means that the water came from two sources, from the fountains of the deep and two from the floodgates of the sky. It appears the continental plates were shifted and the continents formed when the fountains of the deep opened and the water gushed out. It's also believed that the water canopy God created at creation came down upon the earth. Now did the great flood cover the whole earth? Genesis 7:17 7, says, Then the great flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. And the water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits, or 26 feet, or 8 meters, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he wiped out every living thing that was upon the face of the land from mankind to animals to crawling things and to the birds of the sky and they were all wiped out from the earth, and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. So scripture is very clear that the flood covered the mountains everywhere. It uses references over and over again under the heavens, all, every, so the flood wasn't just local. It's also clear from the Bible and archeological evidence that the great flood covered all the earth under the heavens. Now for those who say the flood account was just a local event and not worldwide, which is a popular belief today, some just say it's a local event, they overlook the fact that all people and animals not in the ark could have easily left the area of a local flood and migrated to higher ground. In so doing, they wouldn't have been destroyed as scripture says. Also, much more than just a local area of the earth was populated, so the flood had to be global to destroy all the other animals and humans upon the earth. Now, how long was there water upon the earth? And I think you're gonna find this very fascinating, how long the water was actually upon the earth. So we'll look at just a timeline, looking at the days 
of how long the water was upon the earth. Now it should be noted that Noah entered the ark seven days before the flood actually started. So that gave them time to get all accustomed to everything, get a system down. So they were there seven days, and then after that is when the flood began. So day one, the flood begins in the 600th year of Noah's life. In the second month, on the 17th day of the month, the fountains of the great deep broke apart, and the windows of heaven were opened, and it began to rain as found in Genesis 7:11. So now we come to day 40. The massive deluge of rain ends after 40 days and nights in the third month on the 27th day of the month as found in Genesis 7:11 and Genesis 7:17. Now we come to day 150. The waters continue to prevail on the whole earth 110 days after the flood stops in the 7th month on the 17th day of the month, as found in Genesis 7:24 and Genesis 8:4, And again, on day 150, it says the waters begin to recede and the ark rest on the mountains of Ararat in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, as found in Genesis 7:24 and Genesis 8:4. Now, Scripture says that the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Ararat was a territory originally called Urartu. Notice that the ark didn't rest upon Mount Ararat, but upon the mountains of Ararat. Now when we look carefully at verses 4 and 5, they seem hard to understand. Genesis 8:4 says, Then in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. But then Genesis 8:5 says, and the water decreased steadily until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Now this seems confusing as the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat 74 days before the mountains were visible. Now how could this be? Well, this becomes very clear when we understand and realize that the ark had drogue stones that were used to stabilize the ark. Now these drogue stones were massive stones that hung down under the ship and were used to stabilize it. They were used in ancient times and acted like sailboat ballast today. They created a drag in turbulent waters to prevent a ship from slipping sideways against the waves. In calmer waters, they were used as sounding mechanisms to find out how deep the water was, how far the land was below the water. Therefore, the drogue stones of the ark caused it to stop and rest on the mountains. Afterward, when the water level dropped, the ark touched down and sat on the land. So this explains why the ark came to rest. The drogue stones touched down and held it somewhat in place. Then as the water continued to recede, and the mountains were visible, then the ark actually touched down on the land. Interestingly, these stones have been found in the area where it's believed Noah's ark came to rest. We will be looking at these drogue and anchor stones in more detail when we look at all the evidence for the location of Noah's ark in eastern Turkey in the mountains of Ararat. Then we come to day 224. The tops of the mountains become visible in the 10th month on the first day of the month, as found in Genesis 8:5, Between days 150 and days 224 is when the ark touched down upon dry land. Then on day 264, Noah sent out a raven in the 11th month, on the 11th day of the month, as found in Genesis 8:6. On day 271, a dove is sent out and returns to Noah in the 11th month, on the 18th day of the month, as found in Genesis 8, 6 through 12. On day 278, the dove is sent out again and returns with an olive leaf in the 11th month on the 25th day of the month as found in Genesis 8, 10 through 11. On day 285, the dove is sent out again and does not return. This happens in the 12th month on the second day of the month as found in Genesis 8, 12. On day 314, the earth's surface is dried up in the 601st year of Noah's life in the first month, on the first day of the month, 
as found in Genesis 8.13. Then on day 370, Noah, his family, and the animals leave the ark. This happens in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, as found in Genesis 8.14-17. through 17. So taking all this time into account, the earth wasn't dry until 314 days after the flood. This is equivalent to around 10 months. Altogether, Noah and the animals were in the ark a total of 377 days. This is equivalent to just over a year's time. So we often overlook how much time Noah and the animals spent in the ark. How did the flood change the earth's climate? The Bible and geology support that before the flood, there was a water canopy above the earth that caused a greenhouse-like effect on the whole earth. This seems to be affirmed by God in Genesis 1-6 and Genesis 7-11. Genesis 1-6 says, Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were below the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. So we see from this that there was an expanse of water above the earth. It was like a greenhouse effect. And Genesis 7, 11 and 12 says, The floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. This is talking about the great deluge. So it appears that this canopy from above, which were the floodgates of the sky, were opened and came down upon the earth. Therefore, it appears that before the flood, the earth was like a huge greenhouse that was tropical in nature worldwide. This is why there has been found lush tropical vegetation evidence and tropical fossils at the northern and southern poles. When the flood occurred, the water canopy in the sky came down upon the earth, and the earth's climate was permanently changed because there was no longer a water canopy to protect the earth and keep the heat in, rapid cooling took place at the northern and southern poles and the higher mountains. The earth was exposed to the upper atmosphere without a water canopy, causing instant freezing toward the northern and southern poles and the higher elevation mountains. This is evidenced and proven by animals being found frozen instantaneously in ice, and as mentioned, lush tropical vegetation evidence and tropical fossils at both the northern and southern poles and high mountains have been discovered. Now where did all the water go after the flood? God says in Genesis 7:19 that the water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. This means there were high mountains and all of them on the entire earth were covered with water. God also says that the great deluge of water lasted 40 days and nights. Then it says that the earth's surface dried up on day 314 after the original 40 days of the great deluge. So this means there was water on the earth for around 274 days after the flood waters stopped. Now where did all this water go? We basically have four options. One, the Earth's continents, ocean valleys, and mountains slowly changed over the 274 days after the Great Deluge so that the water settled in the lower elevations of the Earth. Two, the water that had come from the fountains of the deep from below the Earth's surface returned to their original place under the Earth during this 274 days. Three, in the same way God creates, He can, in a sense, uncreate. So God could easily just have supernaturally caused the water to disappear over the 274 days after the Great Deluge. And four, a combination of the first three could have all taken place simultaneously. I should mention 
that one of the biggest problems in believing the events of the Bible, like the creation of the universe, Noah and the Great Flood, the Exodus, the Red Sea crossing, and so forth, is that we try to understand and explain these events by only using natural laws of science. God is supernatural and can do anything he wants. He is not bound to natural laws. In fact, he created all the natural laws. However, as the creator, he can bypass any natural law he desires. When he does so, we call it a miracle. This is why the miracles Jesus did and countless other miracles all throughout the Bible are possible. God was just moving and overriding these natural laws. Even those today who are born again and saved experience a new nature given to them by God, which is supernatural. So every true believer has experienced a personal miracle of being born again and giving a new heart, desires, and nature. Now what did Noah do shortly after the great flood? Genesis 8:20 20 and 21 says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every kind of clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. So Noah worshiped the Lord after the flood, and God instituted the rainbow as a promise he would never again destroy those upon the earth with another great flood. So again, if the flood would have been just local, as some claim, then every time there is a local flood, God would be breaking his promise he established regarding the rainbow. Now is there evidence today for the location of Noah's Ark? The answer is yes. There is overwhelming evidence for the location of Noah's Ark that can be seen today, and I'm really excited to share this with you. The site we'll be looking at has far more evidence than any other proposed place. It's known today as the Drupanar site, but it is not new as it has been venerated for thousands of years. Now we have done a complete video dedicated to the overwhelming evidence that can be seen today regarding the location of Noah's Ark. It's called Noah's Ark Discovered Documentary. We'll have it linked below in this video and at the end as well. Be sure to watch it as you will be touched by all that can be seen today that reveals Noah's Ark was real and did exist. Now in this video, we'll just see some of the highlights of the evidence that can be seen today. This consists of Noah's Ark National Park, which is located about 17 miles or 28 kilometers south of Mount Ararat, about 260 miles or 450 kilometers west of the Caspian Sea, and about 200 miles or 320 kilometers east of the Black Sea. Then we have the actual Noah's Ark boat location shape here. Noah's Ark Visitor Center, Drogue and Anchor Stones, Ancient Stones with Carvings, Ancient Relics and Objects, Carvings of the Tower of Babel, and Carvings about what seems to be the different levels of the Ark, Noah's home that is believed to have been discovered, Noah's altar and corrals, where Noah could have had animals and vineyards, the mountains of Ararat, Mount Ararat, a place called the Wall of Heaven, a place called the Crow Won't Land, a place called the Village of the Eight, where many of these drogue stones and anchor stones are located, a steel, an ostracon, and name locations that reveal the sites around Noah's Ark that have been here for centuries, if not millenniums, and historical eyewitness accounts dating back thousands of years who claim to have seen the remains of Noah's Ark. 
Again, be sure to watch our other video to see all the overwhelming evidence in detail for the existence and reality of Noah's Ark that can be seen today. Now let's look at some faith lessons we can learn from Noah's Ark. What would God desire to teach us at this site? So the first faith lesson is do we truly believe the biblical account of Noah and the ark and the great flood that they really did happen and that they're not myths as some would claim. Now today there's a raging battle taking place between those who want to eliminate a literal account of the creation of the universe and the great flood accounts as found in Genesis 1 through 8. The battle is between those who attempt to explain every earthly event by using only the natural laws of nature. In other words, they eliminate the existence of God and the supernatural. Therefore, they are only left with natural explanations for everything that occurred in the past. Now, God tells us that the answer to these apparent dilemmas is faith, that we should believe God, even though we maybe don't understand all the details. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed or created by the word of God, so that the things that are seen were not made of things which are visible. Creation was a supernatural event that God did that we need to believe by faith. Scripture says that God spoke the worlds into existence, and we need to believe that. We need to trust that. However, it's not a blind trust because there's evidence everywhere that supports the fact that God did create. We see intelligent design everywhere. Everywhere you look, you see intelligent design in everything. Additionally, God says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11:6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Mankind's problem is that they trust in their own intelligence and beliefs rather than trusting God. Proverbs 3, 5 clarifies this problem and the solution. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And that's exactly what a lot of people who believe in evolution do. They first, they don't want anything to do with God, so they eliminate God, and they trust in their own understanding, and they don't trust in God. Now, the Bible actually says that unbelief is a sin. Hebrews 3.12 says, Take care, brothers and sisters, that there will not be found in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart, that falls away from the living God. So an evil, unbelieving heart is actually a sin according to God. So what about us? Do we believe that God created the universe in six literal days? Do we believe in the great flood account, Noah and the ark? Do we believe those things? Or are we torn away and drawn away by those who deny God, his existence, and try to understand everything through their own lens of their self-human understanding. So really it's a matter of faith. It's that simple. Do we believe the creation account? Do we believe the great flood, Noah's Ark? Do we believe those things? If we don't, then that reveals a lack of faith. And once again, we can see evidence for these things all throughout creation. So it's not a blind faith. It's a faith based on evidence as well. Second, do we understand why God sent the great flood to begin with? The purpose of the great flood was to destroy all the wicked people on the earth. Now, while this might sound cruel, it is actually an exercise of God's mercy and justice. Sin causes heartache and suffering. When sin reaches such a severe state, then God will step in and eliminate. This is what he did with the flood. This is what he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, with the Canaanite nation that the Israelites drove out. When sin reaches such a high state, severe state, then God will step in and eliminate. And that's actually an act of mercy because sin brings death and destruction. And we also believe that children who are under the age of accountability, they go to heaven so they are saved from all this life of destruction as well. 
Also, we need to realize that our time on Earth is very, very brief. It's just a speck of time, and we're all going to die eventually. So it's not really that drastic if someone dies younger rather than older. In, in the grand scheme of time, it's not that big of a thing. So what about us? Do we believe that we're going to give an account to God for what we believe and how we live our lives? God will hold us accountable. So we should trust in God. We should believe what he says. We should take by faith what God's word says and believe it, even though some are going to try to explain it away. We should believe it. We should believe a literal interpretation of it. And I should mention there are many, even Christians today, who are leaning towards different beliefs regarding the first eight chapters of Genesis. They're tending to want to interpret those as figurative or as day-age theories, a lot of time between the days of creation, etc. Why? Because they're falling prey to what appears to be the evidence and the beliefs of the evolutionist. So what about us? Taking into account all that we have seen, are we serious about our relationship with God? Are we right with the Lord? Or are we like those in the days of Noah that were so busy eating and drinking, living their lives, who didn't have time for God, and then were destroyed in the flood? Are we like them? Or are we like people today who Jesus said would be like in the days of Noah, people today who are just eating, drinking, living their life, not serious about God, not serious about their Creator, and just living their life as they want? What kind of people are we? If we're wise, we'll be those who are right with our Creator, who are serious about following Christ, who believe what God's Word says, and are living that out. So what kind of people are we? Are we like those in the days of Noah and people today who reject God? Or are we those who trust in God's Word, have received Him, and are serious about walking with Him and serving Him? So thank you for watching this video, and may God richly bless you. What did you think of the video? That was a great video, I think. And the question comes, what about us? Are we part of that group that should go under the waters? Well, we know friends that are. If we're not, we certainly know people that aren't. What is, our, what is our responsibility here? Do we have a responsibility? Is God calling on us to do certain things? And if so, what, is, what are those things? I believe he's called on all of us to, to be a witness. You are my witnesses, he said. And we are to start where? Right here in this community and to expand out to Hillsborough and expand to the state and the country and the world. But we start right here. So if you haven't started right here, I urge you to go back and consider that because God is considering it as a, as a commandment to us, not just a suggestion we do it, you are my witnesses. We're not just, I'm not, if you're not doing anything today, would you go out and share Jesus with somebody and just tell them about him, what he's doing for you? That's not what he's saying. He said do it as a purpose because we are given that as an objective to do. That's our job. And, um, uh, I'll tell you one thing, once you start doing it and you start feeling Jesus help you with it all along, he will help you every time you talk to someone. He will allow you to say what he wants you to say. It's amazing. You end up talking about things and doing, saying things you never thought you would say. That's, that's what I'm finding. But I'm finding also that Jesus is allowing what we say 
when we do those things to affect people. And they come to know Jesus themselves, not because of me or anyone else that speaks to them, but because God is touching them. So we can't control the results, but we have a responsibility to control the message. We need to share the word, the witness. And what is a witness? The witness is what's happened to me. Don't know what's happened to you. I can't really share what's happening but to you. I can relate to it maybe, but I can't really share the personal part of it. And that personal part of it is what gets to open hearts of those who are lost. And what you share may not have the same impact as what someone else shares. But if we share, and that's why it's, it sometimes takes maybe 10, 15 times for that person being approached and shared Jesus with before they realize and come, somebody clicks. God leads someone to them that clicks and they find Jesus as a result. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And, you know, I'm convinced that my generation, which is partially your generation too, because <laughs> my, but my generation, we didn't do it. We didn't do our share. We didn't do our part. Now, what I'm looking at as a result of that, there are more people not doing their part. And if, you know, if that's the wrong, wrong uh, trajectory of this project, you know, if it's a, you call it a project, it, it's saying that you're going down instead of than up. Because if, if you don't share, who's sharing? Who's sharing? If I don't share, who's sharing? And if no one shares, who goes to, who comes to know Jesus? Does it have to be a miracle every time that somebody gets struck by lightning to, to accept Jesus? I'm convinced God will find a way to lead those he wants to have salvation to him, but that's not his command. His, his, he said he's doing it through us. That's what his commandment means. I'm doing it through you. You are the one. I'm expecting you to carry out my mission so that your friends and your neighbors will know or have an opportunity to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Oh, what an awesome opportunity that is. What an awesome blessing it is when you when you realize that people are changing their lives because you're following God's commandment. And you know, you're talking to a guy that could not speak to uh, any, I couldn't speak to three people. If three people, if you were sitting here and two or three people and I had to stand up, I could not do it. I could not do it. I thought I was getting fired from my company because I could not do it. Now, that's pretty serious. And, uh, but you know, I wanted to do it. I really, in my heart, wanted to be able to do it. And and it took it took seven Sundays of people like you who were in this church who said, "We'll we'll help you. We'll help you overcome this thing." And I'm saying to you, I'll help you overcome this thing if you are willing to step out in faith and do something. I will help you. I can't do it for you. And they couldn't do it for me. I had to do it myself. Seven Sundays. Just all I had to do is stand up and welcome visitors. Seven Sundays it took me to do it. That's a long process. But God blessed me after that. He's really, really, truly blessed me. He's allowed me to speak. 
in places I never thought I would speak, do to people I never thought I could speak to. And so I'm, I'm sharing that with you so that you have a hope. If I can do it, you can do it. That's, that's the old slogan. If I can do it, you can do it. You know, and that's true. If he allowed me to do it, he, you know, in high school, I never took a, I never stood up and took a, did an oral thing from the front of the school to the room. Couldn't do it. I took the zero grade or a failing grade every time. So, well, it's been a blessing today to share with you these thoughts and to see this video. I think we've been, we've got some some confidence now that God is in control and he does want us to work with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for these that are here. We pray, Father, that your will will be done in all that we say, all that we do, and all that we are. Forgive me, Lord, and forgive us as we go day by day. Help us to seek to be in your will and to walk with you and to seek to share Jesus wherever we go and wherever we can. And we give you praise, honor, and glory for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.